Hello, and welcome to the Lore of Brawnhaven. <clears throat> Today we'll be closing out our discussion on optional rules for the Brawnhaven campaign setting, and we're going to be getting into uh, temperature effects. So <clears throat> these, of course, are optional rules, um, and the, these can be found in the Skellis Mountain source book. <clears throat> but um, I will tell you that they were all extrapolated from uh, the first edition AD&D book, uh, the Wilderness Survival Guide. And the rules that are in the Skellis Mountain source book are geared, of course, towards um, cold weather climbs because this was specifically about the Skellis Mountains itself. <clears throat> and so the referees that want to add a, a more uh, realistic and treacherous um, environmental effect can use these rules uh, quite effectively. Um, I know that it changed a, a lot of the way my characters handle hex crawls because they're going to be taking into account um, it, it's more important to find shelter, um, whether it just be a rock overhang or uh, to help break the wind or to help shelter their tents a bit more from uh, heavy rains. Um, there was one instance where they even had trouble keeping the fire going because of the rain. Um, it slows movement down. Um, but the environment itself and uh, the the temperature and weather effects can actually almost become a uh, foe and a monster in and of itself that the characters have to uh, succeed at angst. Um, because if they don't, then that's pretty much the end, uh, right? <clears throat> And so, in order to first get into uh, into this, we ha we'll we'll have to discuss temperature. And there's a difference between the effective temperature and a character's personal temperature. And so, effective temperature of the environment is the temperature modified by the wind chill. And so, uh, for instance, it could be 30 degrees, but now there's a 25 mile per hour gust, and suddenly, it, 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 to the character, it feels like the outside temperature is like 23. Um, so, <clears throat> because of this, whatever clothing, in addition to their armor, can suddenly become very important. Now, armor itself is going to give some uh, protection, um, and this this can this can really have adverse effects in hotter climates. Uh, for instance, like plate mail. Um, you know, if you if you are wearing plate um, in uh, you know, 76 or higher uh, degrees Fahrenheit, um, plate mail is going to offer plus 30 degrees uh, personal temp. <clears throat> Suddenly, that plate mail, they're, they're going to want to be doffing that armor because it's its way too uncomfortable and hot to be walking around like that. Um, because now you're talking about 100 degrees, um, and they're just going to be sweating bullets. <clears throat> But so everything uh, can be modified depending on the temperature. So like very cold weather gear in negative one or more is going to give plus 30. At zero to 30, it's plus 40 um, degrees. So uh, a lot of those items like uh, cold weather or, or very cold weather gear can be worn uh, either just underneath your armor or in a lot of cases like a heavy cloak can be worn over it, uh, providing giving that kind of protection um, to to the uh, character versus cold weather. Now, cold weather, uh, ha the temperature has a certain effect on the characters. Um, at, uh, if their personal temperature is, for instance, negative 9 to 0 degrees, um, that means they're, they're really cold. Um, they're going to be uncomfortable. They're going to have a minus 1 to strength, minus 2 to dex. Uh, they're only going to be able to move 3 quarters of their movement, and all of their attacks are going to be at minus 1. And this gets worse the colder it gets. Um, it can also be pretty bad at high temperatures. Um, I mean, if you're in 90 plus degree heat, um, you're going to have minus two to strength, minus two to con. You're going to move three quarters movement and a minus one to attacks. So there is like the sweet spot in temperature where you're not going to, your personal temperature, where you're not going to be suffering any detrimental effects. But... Um, you know, in cold weather, uh, which is what we're really uh, shooting for here, um, you're going to want to bring that personal temperature up so that you don't suffer these effects. Now, in addition to uh, adding wind chill, wind can have effects on missile weapons. <clears throat> and so um, at like 
uh, 21 to 30 mile per hour wind gusts, um, your missile attacks are going to be at nine, uh, minus one for short range, minus two for medium range, minus three for long range. And if and in some cases, when when the wind gets really strong, attacks are not going to be possible at all. At 31 to 45 miles per hour, long range attacks are impossible. And at 80 plus miles per hour, any any range is going to be impossible. The missile simply cannot make it to its uh, intended destination uh, because the wind is knocking it off course. Now, of course, you also have uh, weather events themselves that can cause damage. One of the most common ways for that to happen is for hailstorms. Um, people, people down in Texas know this. Um, some of the people in some areas here in the Washington and Oregon areas know this as well. Hailstones can, can fall and be quite large. We're not talking about the little white hail that most people think of when there's a hailstorm. No, no, these are the size of softballs and uh, can destroy your car and do all sorts of bad damage. Um, now, your armor will, de if you're wearing plate, full plate, or banded mail, you're, if you can bring your shield up and protect your head, you're going to be immune to, to the damage. You're going to get knocked around, but you're not going to take any damage through that, through that heavy armor. If you're wearing uh, anything less, uh, chain, scale, or uh, studded leather, or leather, um, then yeah, you're going to take some damage. Leather uh, armor, if the hailstone is going to be up to a half inch in diameter size, you're going to take 1d3. At 1 to and a half inches, you'll take a d4. And if it's over 1 and 2 thirds inches, uh, you're going to be taking d6. Now, this happens, uh, there's a 2 and 6 chance every round. That you're gonna gonna hit get hit. So um, the good news is that hailstorms are usually fairly brief. They wreak a lot of havoc in a short amount of time, and then they move on. I would I would say probably one d10 rounds, um, but it, it should be kept in mind that uh, every round there's a two and six chance that you're gonna take this damage. So. Um, you're probably going to want to find, again, you're going to want to look for shelter. Look for something that's going to cover your head. So the temperature, not only does it cause a detriment to, um, to, your, to your stats and your movement and your, a penalty to your attacks, but it can also deal damage. And this damage, um, you know, once you start... Uh, once you start getting into extreme weather, uh, this damage is going to go directly to strength, dex, and con. And <clears throat> you'll want to take a, they'll need to take a uh, con ability check. So they need to roll under their con score every turn, so every 10 minutes. Um, to, and if they fail that check, they're going to take uh, damage. Uh, depending on what their personal temperature is and whether they're protected or unprotected. Um, and that they'll take that damage directly to strength, dex, and con. They'll also take uh, one point to wisdom. And all of those scores uh, can go down to a minimum of three. Now, <clears throat> if a player who is uh, who has no protection, if he fails three con ability checks in a row, or if a player who has protection fails six in a row, um, either way, they have failed. They are now going hypothermic in the cold weather. And um, once they're hypothermic, they go unconscious, um, and they, they will die in 2d4 rounds. Um, it's not a hit point loss thing. They will flat out die in 2d4 rounds if, if they are not uh, found and helped. On paper, it's really easy to counteract hypothermia. Um, you simply get them to someplace that is warmer. And uh, and once you do that, if you get them inside a, a heavy tent next to a fire, um, they will immediately stop taking damage from from this uh, from the hypothermic event. Now, uh, something to be something that should be uh, really thought about if you want to get into this level of detail is that. Um, cold weather damage, <clears throat> and this is mostly going to be role play, but cold weather damage should go to affected parts first. So <clears throat> let's say that the character is uh, is taking cold damage, 
and they do not have a fur-lined hat with a face wrap or a scarf. So they're going to be taking that damage directly to their ears and nose. <clears throat> um, if they take six points of damage, um, then, uh, then their chance of uh, being surprised goes up to four and six, and they have minus one to their initiative. Uh, if, they, if they take that to their nose, uh, six points to their to their nose. They're going to forever now be at minus two charisma because their nose is black and will probably fall off, if not turn gangrenous. And then you should see the the rules on infection. But but yeah. Um. So it, it, there can be serious effects uh, to taking this to, to taking cold damage. Luckily, uh, there is equipment uh, that is able to prevent. A, a good portion of that and your players are if you're if they're going up into the mountains uh most of these items uh can be found for instance in Stagham, which is a good good place in the foothills of the skulls mountains you can go to Stagham. most of this equipment will be made available um one piece that is available almost everywhere of course is bandages uh last week we talked about um, the uh, bleeding out rules and uh, the need for clean linen bandages. Um, they cost one copper and you get 12 of them. I, I, I don't recommend skimping on the ba bandages. But you're going to be able to purchase other things in Stagham uh, and other small towns and villages will have this uh, along, the, um, along the foothills of the Skelos Mountains, such as fur-lined bedrolls. Um, these are much heavier bedrolls with a fur lining. They're going to weigh about 60 coins in weight, um, but well worth it. Uh, almost a, a, a requirement if you're going to be sleeping uh, overnight in the mountains without... Uh, well, even if, if you do have a tent, it, you're still going to want one of these because it, it does... In the higher climates, even in the middle of summer, uh, because of the glaciers and things of that nature, um, it, it is not... Uh, beyond the realm of reason that in, you know, the, the deep summer months that at night it can get down to 20 degrees, um, and that's in, the, that's in summer. Uh, there are other items that you can buy, fur-lined boots, which can help uh, protect your feet from frostbite. Um, heavy cloaks. Now, heavy cloaks are great because they're, they're heavy wool with a fur lining. Um, a lot of them have a fur-lined hood that can be flipped up. And uh, these will fit over your armor, so you're you're going to gain the benefit of the heavy cloak plus whatever arm on top of whatever armor you're wearing. Um, and then, of course, like I said, there's cold weather clothing and very cold weather clothing. Um, cold weather clothing just consists of thick wool shirts and breeches, um, rated down to about negative nine degrees Fahrenheit. But whereas very cold weather clothing. Um, it, adds a uh, fur-lined wool jacket to that and uh, or, or a vest or sometimes both and that's usually rated for you know the most extreme cold climates and though the jacket can be worn of course over uh, armor whereas the you know the shirt and the breeches of course are going to be under whatever it is that you're wearing over it for armor um a lot of the travel that goes through the Skellis Mountains and into, uh, or well into Stagina, especially by the humans that live in Stagina, is going to be done by dog sled. Um, horses and carts are not uh, very useful in deep snow and ice, and so dog sleds have become pretty much the standard. So, uh, in Stagholm, you can actually rent a dog sled and a team of dogs, um, and this is a very common method of travel. Now, a dog sled, uh, in the book I wrote that it's a half mile per hour. Um, it, I kind of modified that a little bit uh, for my characters when they were doing their hex crawl through the mountains. Um, with a dog sled, I allow them to move 24 miles per day. If they're on uh, the eastern tradeway, if they're following the road, they can move two hexes. With Those are 12-mile hexes. 24 miles per day. If they go off off the beaten path, then it's only 12 miles per day. Um, but this was to uh, kind of answer the question of why have a road? Um, the, the point of a road is to facilitate travel from point A to point B, and if you're not gaining any benefit from that, then you might as well just go wherever. Um, and so that kind of answered the question, well, if you're on the road, you can, you can get two hexes worth of travel. If you're off, you, you're only going to move one. 
Um, in addition uh, to dog sleds, you can, in Stagum, as we discussed, you can, uh, previously, you can, um, you can hire a guide, which is going to help with hunting and, and foraging, and they'll know the area, they'll know some of the inhabitants of the area, and this can make, this can make your life a lot easier um, as far as um, keeping yourselves fed, keeping yourselves warm, finding shelter. The guide's going to help a lot more with that, and, and that should be taken into account by referees too. Um, so, I mean, if your players decide that they're going to skimp and they're just going to go their own way, well, then you can really throw everything at them. Um, but if they take a guide, you can be a little bit gentler on them because the guide's going to know uh, places where they can they can camp for the night and not and not be out in the weather. Additionally, the mountains are can be the terrain can be treacherous. There are crampons uh, that are metal spikes that can be uh, strapped onto the boots uh, to provide um, traction uh, to prevent slipping. Um, there, of course, are snowshoes uh, that are wood frames uh, with leather gut. Um, that basically widen the surface area of each foot so that you can uh, travel unimpeded through uh, heavy snow or deep snow. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, as we said, fur hats, uh, most of these fur hats are, you know, your Davy Crockett style hat. Um, they're going to be made of water repellent furs such as beaver or rabbit and, or, or raccoon. And uh, a lot of them ha will have ear flaps <clears throat> and even a face wrap to protect your, your nose um, to prevent that, that frostbite damage. <clears throat> there are two types of hand protection. <clears throat> there are heavy gloves, which are fur-lined leather gloves, um, and they are regular gloves, so each finger is individual. <clears throat> and... Um, these are rated for down to about nine, negative nine degrees, and they allow full use of equipment. Um, heavier uh, and for the more, more extreme cold climates, you're looking more at fur mittens. Now, because mittens are going to cover up the fingers, um, that does impose a negative four penalty to the use of um, melee weapons. And ranged attacks are going to be pretty much impossible. Um, I, I might allow the use of a sling, uh, but I would I would definitely impose the negative four penalty to the sling as well. But a crossbow or a bow is going to be impossible uh, with mittens. Um, that's just that's just not going to be uh, something that can be done. And finally, for getting around the mountains, you've got uh, climbing spikes and uh, climbing picks. So spikes, very similar to what adventurers would normally wear to spike shut doors or thieves would use to spike shut uh, pit traps, things like that. Except that these have an iron loop on the end that rope can be run through. And uh, those can be hammered in with a climbing pick. Now, a climbing pick is double-sided. On one side, it has a long curved uh, spike that can be driven into ice uh, or snow um, to facilitate climbing. The other side has a short uh, knobby hammer on it uh, that can be used for driving in the spikes. And so you might have somebody that has climbed up a ways, bang in a spike, and then uh, you know run the rope through it so that the, their compadres down below can then um, you know climb up. And then the last uh, item on the equipment list uh, is the heavy tent. Now, heavy tents are a heavy hide, uh, usually double layered, and they are going to be fur lined. So the outside or, or is going to have fur over it. Um, they will sleep about four people. Um, they are quite a bit heavier than a regular tent, but that shouldn't be too much of an issue. If you're traveling through the Skeletal Mountains, you probably are going to get a dog sled. And so, um, you know, a sled can be can be used to carry this tent. And uh, many of them have actually a leather flap that will allow a chimney, so you can actually build a small fire inside the tent. And uh, these are rated for the most extreme temperatures. Uh, you know, if you're going to camp out on the glaciers um, far to the north, um, this is exactly the type of shelter you're going to want to carry with you. And as I said, one tent will hold like four people. So um, they're made a little bit bigger uh, and heavier because um, 
the idea is to keep, you know, you want four people in there because that generates heat in and of itself. Body heat will help uh, keep the inside of that tent warm in addition to a fire. So that's going to cover it for uh, the optional rules uh, on uh, or in the Brawnhaven campaign setting. And next week we will be talking about, or, or not next week, uh, Thursday, we will be talking about, um, we will be going back down the eastern slope of the mountains into the foothills uh, on the banks of the Great River um, where there is the Rock Skull Orcs and their encampment there as well as a um, mine that the dwarves of Zlatoheim had originally um, prospected and ultimately lost uh, and is now overrun with goblin tribes. And so on Thursday we will start discussing that. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time on The Lore of Bronhaven.